Good morning. Boy, we are inside and outside and everywhere else this morning. Welcome to Westwood Presbyterian Church. Did everybody get a palm branch that wants one? We've got them all over the place. And so, yes, you can wave them uh, while we sing or just uh, please, we just ask that you don't hit your neighbor with it. Okay, please don't do that or, or have a sword fight. I'm Pastor Tom Wiley. It's sure good to see everybody here this morning. Welcome to everyone joining us online as well here on this Palm Sunday. Uh, if it seems like bedlam around here, it, it's because it is bedlam around here. We had uh, Pablo the donkey joined us and we have just marched around the building, me and the kids, and we sang hosannas. Uh, I'm not sure if they marched around behind the donkey, but they probably followed them. So we are celebrating this Palm Sunday morning. Welcome to church. Welcome to Westwood. I'd call your attention to some of the announcements uh, that are in your bulletin. I won't read every darn one of them. Uh, we've got a lot going on because today officially kicks off Holy Week. So we've already marched with the donkey, but there's a lot more to come. On Monday, Thursday, this Thursday evening at 7 o'clock, we will have a special worship service in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, it will be a uh, Seder worship. We will not have the Passover meal as Jesus and the disciples did, but we'll do pretty much everything else. Uh, honoring the Jewish tradition, remembering Passover. And we will conclude that special service with communion, uh, perhaps similar to the way that Jesus did when he instituted uh, the sacrament of communion for us all. But if you haven't, if you're here in this area and want to join us, we will not be streaming this one to my knowledge, I don't think. Uh, but it will be here in the building. If you haven't already signed up, the sign-up sheet is out there in the atrium. Please sign up so we'll have a place setting for you and be ready to come and worship our Lord together. Then on Sunday morning, we will have an, a sunrise service at 6.30 in the south end of the building in the, on the parking lot. We'll gather in the dark and we will leave in the daylight as we welcome our Lord with a short, with a brief uh, worship. And it will be followed by an opportunity for uh, continental breakfast uh, that will be served by the fellowship committee, I believe, it is taking the lead with this one. So if you want to avail yourself to that, please mark your calendar on that. Then also, and I, there's the worship service, um, at, we will have a combined service next Sunday. So please don't come at 10.30 like we are doing this time. Come a little earlier. Please don't come at 9 o'clock like you normally would do for the praise service. Come a little later. It's in between at 9.28, just to get your attention. And we will have a combined service with our wonderful praise team and our wonderful choir and uh, traditional music as well for a blended service as we celebrate Easter. I, and we'll also have some members from the uh, Wichita Symphony who will be joining us to praise God on Easter Sunday. So please mark your calendar for any and all of those, plus any of the others that I didn't mention now. And I believe, let's see, I think, well, there was a big cleanup going on here yesterday. And um, I, I got by, uh, it was at around eight o'clock. And if you came by the building at eight, you probably saw a flurry of activity and a whole lot of cars and people doing things. And you know how preachers do, I tried to time it until to come right as they were leaving so they wouldn't need my help and I could thank everybody. They were gone. I got here at 11.30 and they were done, but they had spruced up the building inside and out. So if you see the uh, freshly trimmed shrubs and everything else, it's due to a few people. And this guy right over here to my left was partly responsible, greatly responsible for quite a bit of it. And I believe he has a little announcement for us now. So here's Carl. We had a great day yesterday, and we had about 23 people show up to help us, and we were pretty busy and got a lot done. We also have a couple of other projects that we are going to take part in doing. Uh, we have a couple of members that need some help with yard work, just trimming, raking, uh, cleaning things up, and we're going to do that on April the 30th. So it's two different places, and anybody would like to volunteer and help us, there's a sign-up sheet on the table out there. Please sign up, and we'll probably meet here about 8 in the morning, have some donuts and coffee, and then head out to do that. So we especially, again, want to thank everybody that showed up. So please sign up and show up for that and help us, and that's another project that our committee's in charge of. 
Thank you, Carl. And thank you to everybody. If, if you were here helping clean up yesterday, would you please stand? We had some in, in first service. There's Susan, there's Grace. Thank you, folks, for all you've done. Thank you for a wonderful job in preparing for Holy Week here at Westwood. So, um, also, I, I believe we have one more announcement at this time, and maybe a slide to go with it. So, here's Donna from our fellowship committee. Good morning, everyone. Um, the fellowship committee is and has the privilege of creating. Tom, what are, what are you doing? Why are you dressed like that? What? I'm getting ready. Haven't you heard? Heard what? No, no, no. It's it's Westwood, not West Africa. Eh? No, no. You've got this all wrong. It's Westwood. It's Westwood, and we're taking pictures of all the new members, um, regular members, new attenders, just everyone that we can um, get into our new pictorial directory. Not wildlife. Not wildlife. No, no. Just um, just members and, and regular attenders. So. Well, and then we're going to put all of these into the directory. Some of them are wild. <laughs> I'm glad you made that comment. <laughs> um, we're going to get all these pictures and um, information from each one of you. We're going to compile those, get those into a directory. And we're very excited about this part. Once the directory is ready to go, it's going to be available to you on an app, on your smartphone, on your computer at home, and also in a written format. Um, so we're really excited about that part. Uh, when you come to have your picture taken, be ready to fill out a little form that will ask all the information we need, like um, phone numbers and email addresses. We just want to make sure that we have everybody's information um, correct. And we're going to be taking pictures for several weeks to come so that we have the opportunity to catch just as many people as we can. And um, I've had a little bit of concern from a few people that the pictures are going to be open up to the whole world. That's not the case. It's password protected. It'll just be available to our congregation. And um, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to grab one of us from the fellowship committee, and I'll be able to answer any questions you might have. Yeah, no wildlife. No wildlife pictures, no. <laughs> Thank you, Donna. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. Uh, when they came in and made the pitch for this thing, showing me how cool it's going to be, uh, you've heard the term, there's an app for that? That's what this will be. It'll be an app. So if you need to get a hold of anybody in the congregation, it's on your phone. I mean, it's like part, uh, an extension of your own directory. So if you need to call them, if you need to visit them, their, their address will be there, and you can bring up GPS. It's really cool. And uh, thanks, many thanks to the Fellowship Committee for bringing this one to us. Yeah, I think it's going to be a wonderful addition uh, to life and, and fellowship of uh, Westwood Presbyterian Church. Do we have any other announcements that have slipped my mind this morning? I've been singing Hosanna with a donkey, so I may have forgotten. Anything else this morning? Yes, sir. Movie night is coming up. What is that date? It's going to be after Easter. Is it the 30th? Saturday, April 30th, we have movie night sponsored by the Outreach Committee. And what time? 7, 7 o'clock. And we're watching a movie about Aviation Fellowship. Uh, so it's, it's really a cool movie that came on our radar quite a while back. But that'll be the two Sundays. No, one, one Sunday after. It's after Easter. I don't know when. But it's April the 30th. April 30th, Saturday night, April 30th. Mark your calendars for that, and I'm sure that will find its way to our announcements on the screen by next week as well. Well, thank you for that, David. Let's prepare our hearts and minds to worship God here on this Palm Sunday. Our unity song this month is Rock of Ages. And uh, this week we're on verse two. It's, uh, last week uh, we covered verse one, which really was uh, acknowledgement of uh, Jesus as our savior. 
and uh, his sacrifice of dying for um, our sins and cleansing us of guilt. This week, the second verse starts out, not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. This is a reference to uh, the fact that we cannot save ourselves. There is no amount of uh, good works, uh, there's no amount of effort that we can uh, do to avoid uh, our sinfulness. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? So there's no amount of effort uh, that we can put forth. There's no amount of remorse, uh, sadness, regret that can offset uh, our sinfulness. All for sin could not atone. Our efforts cannot save us. Thou must save thou alone. Only Jesus' sacrifice can save us. So if you'd please rise and uh, sing together our unity song. Obviously, if you've looked at your bulletin, I'm not Karen. She's a little under the weather today, so I got to, I got to sub, as I usually do. Would you join me in our call to worship? Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey. Open to me the gates of righteousness. This is the gate of the Lord. I shall give thanks to you, for you have answered me. Shall we pray? Great God of the universe, we have gathered to worship you as the people worshiped your son when he rode into Jerusalem. We offer our praise and thanksgiving for your love and blessings, for your mercy and grace to all your creation. Fill our worship and songs with your Holy Spirit, we pray, so that we may worship you in spirit and in truth. For we ask in the name of Jesus, your son, our savior and redeemer, Amen. Please join now in our gathering hymn, Hosanna, Loud Hosanna, number 174.
us remain standing and say what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and setteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come, that's the quick and the dead. <clears throat> I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. And at this time, if the boys and girls would join me down here at the front, come on down. Did you get a palm branch? Looks like you lost it. Did you give it away? I gave mine away to somebody else when we were out there marching. But I was wondering, is anybody else coming in, other boys and girls? I guess you're it, Paxton. But why do we do this? It's fun. Because today is the day that Jesus came into town. And, but what about these palm branch things? Was it hot or something so we need to keep cool? You remember the story, don't you? Or do you? You know, he came into town, you're exactly right. But people went when they saw him coming. And we had a donkey out here because he rode on a donkey. He went and told his followers, he said, go get this donkey. I know some people down here. And bring it up here. And he got on the donkey. You know who did that back in those days? Only kings would ride on a donkey. And they're like, look, he's riding on the donkey like a king. They knew Jesus because he had been preaching and healing people and things like that. And it's like, let's do something special. So they went and they broke off branches off the trees and they started laying them down because that's what they also did for a king. And it was a special sign. And they were waving the branches too, like we did. And you remember what we were singing out there? Hosanna. And do you know what that means? It means save us. They wanted him to come because it's like he's the guy. He is the Messiah that we read about in our Bibles from a long time ago. And he's going to save us from the Romans. He's going to save us. But he really came to save us from our sins. They didn't know that, though, so they sang, Hosanna. That's why we do it, to remember what they did. But it was really kind of a cool thing because it was a parade for Jesus. Anytime you see one of these, I saw one of these in a, in a plant nursery the other day, and I thought about Jesus. Next time you see a donkey, too. You don't see him very often, especially here in town. But remember that he rode on one just like that. And that's why the cross is on the donkey's back, too. Remember that? Did you see him on Pablo? He has a cross on his back. That's what the legend says, because Jesus rode on a donkey once long ago. Let's thank him for that. Let's pray to him. Let's talk to God. Lord, thank you that, that you came, and that you came into our lives just as you came into town in Jerusalem that time. Help us to always honor and praise you, and remember that we don't have to wait for Palm Sunday. We can praise you any time because of what Jesus did for us. Thank you, Lord. We love you so much. We thank you that Jesus loves us as well. For we pray in his name. Amen. You want this one? You can have it if you want it. All right. You're a blank guy. Thanks, Paxton. Our first lesson this morning is from Zechariah 9.9. <clears throat> Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
some of the choir members come down to sit with family and friends. And as we prepare for our morning prayers, what other prayer requests do we have in addition to the ones that are in the bulletin? Uh, are there any that have prayer requests we received online? Any from the booth upstairs? None? Okay. Do we have? Yes, sir. Okay, give us her first name, please. Lauren, okay. The pool's granddaughter, Lauren, is going to be having surgery down in Oklahoma this week. Okay, tomorrow we will lift up Lauren in prayer. Thank you, thank you, Dan. Who else do we need to pray for this morning? Any prayers back here? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Will you pray with me? No, oh Lord, our God, how excellent is your name in all the earth. We come to you in the morning, but we know that we can come to you anytime. We can come to you in the middle of the night because you are always there. You are always with us. You are always available to us. Lord, show us how to be available to you, to the promptings of your Holy Spirit. Open our eyes to the miracles all around us, miracles that, that you send our way. Open our ears to hear the beauty, whether it's the beauty of your creation or the kind words of those who bring the message of peace. Open our hearts and our hands to respond, to take these blessings in, and to reflect your love, your grace, your mercy and peace with our lives, with our deeds, with our thoughts and aspirations. Lord, we thank you that you've put it in our hearts to follow Jesus Christ, whatever that may mean for each of us. We thank you that you have moved our hearts to want to come and worship you wherever we may be. Lord, we know that you have a purpose for us, just as you have a plan for all people and a plan for this earth. Help us to discover that plan. As we follow Christ, help us to take those blessings and use those blessings. Pass them on. Lord, indeed, make us blessings to others. There are so many challenges we face, so many evils we see. It reminds us that we indeed live in a fallen world. This is not heaven yet, as much as we'd like for it to be. But Lord, help us to remember that you are in the midst of even the struggles we face, the struggles we see others face. So we would lift up those who have special challenges, those who have hideous challenges today. We lift up our brothers and sisters in Ukraine, in all places where people are being persecuted, where people are being killed, some for what they believe, some just because they happen to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. Lord, we pray that you would keep them safe. Lord, we pray for an end to suffering, if it be your will. We pray that you might give those who have to suffer courage. Give them strength. Help them know that they are not alone and see them through, O oh Lord. Lord, we pray that you would touch the, the hearts of oppressors everywhere, those who would deal out death or suffering to others. Touch their hearts, O oh Lord. Help them to see that the way of peace, your peace, is the way through Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray that you would hasten the day when every soldier can come home, when every first responder can stand down, when there are no more dangers, when there are no more fears. Hasten the day where every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to your glory, we pray. 
But in the meantime, Lord, keep us faithful. Help us to fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. As we pray for others, as we lift up those who suffer around us. Lord, we lift up Lauren to you. We lift up those who recover from surgery and illness. We lift up Kelly. We pray for healing for Bob and Vicki, for Shirley and Velma. We pray for healing for Judy and Bob. So many, Lord. But we know that you are the great physician. So we place them in your care. Be with the doctors, the nurses, all who give care, from parents and grandparents to those in the medical field, to teachers, to all who who have heard the call to take care of others. And Lord, we pray that you would show us the way forward as we enter this holy week, this week in which we remember even more what Jesus has done for us. Show us the way forward for this church. Show us the way forward for your universal church, for all believers of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Show us what it means to lead others by following Jesus. Make us indeed instruments of your peace and love, even as Jesus was. We thank you for his life, his ministry, his death and resurrection for us all. And Lord, we pray that you'd hear our voices now as we lift them together as one voice and pray together that prayer that Jesus taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Especially this time of year as we remember with thanksgiving what Jesus has done for us. Let's continue our worship with the offertory. We're still not passing the plates here in the room just yet, but there's a table outside if you haven't already availed yourself to it. Please remember and drop the tithes and offerings in, but most of all, Remember Jesus as we continue with the offertory.
time of year, knowing that Jesus gave all for us. And we pray that you would take the tithes and offerings that we give to you now, a small portion of these marvelous blessings you've given to us and continue to give us. Use them for the work of the kingdom, Lord. Use our lives as well to do Jesus' work. For we pray in his name. Amen. Please be seated. Our second lesson is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 19. And I have 29. I'm going to begin one verse earlier just to put it into context. I'm going to begin with verse 28. After Jesus had said these things, he was going on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he approached Bethphage in Bethany near the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and there as you enter, you'll find a colt tied on, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say, The Lord has need of it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for this word. Thank you for this word about Jesus. We praise you that, like Jesus, this word is alive. So we pray that we might take this living word into our hearts, open our hearts and minds to receive it, and to receive the truth that is in these words, because we know it's from you. Lord, quicken in us a response to this word. For Jesus' sake. Amen. You know, I've always, um, I've always loved to ride bicycles all my life. I don't ride them as much anymore, but ever since I lost those training wheels on the uh, neighbor's hand-me-down bike from our neighbors next door, I've, I've enjoyed riding. Uh, I rode every day when I could as a kid, when the weather was good. And I love that, that feeling of freedom. It, it felt like I was flying. Not like the one in the picture there, but uh, it, it was just a great feeling. I saved up my money the summer I turned 13 to, to buy a Schwinn Continental. Bicycle looks a heck of a lot like that one right there, except mine was green. It was $113 with tax, and it had the center pull brakes, which were more advanced than the, the varsity model. It also cost $10 more than the varsity model. But I went ahead and got the optional generator kit as well. The, you could flip the generator and a little, it would go over and roll against the wheel. Never wore out like batteries did. So I was ready for night driving, even though I really never did that. But I had a headlamp and a light on the back and it was magical. In Scouts, I got cycling merit badge. I, I did six 25 mile bike hikes is what it was required and a 50 miler. And I had a good time on that bike. But long before I got to Schwinn Continental, I had many adventures on, on my red Sears and Roebuck bike. The one that Santa brought when I was seven years old. I was so short that I had to ride the bike standing up because when I sat on the seat, my feet wouldn't reach the pedals, but that didn't stop me. I rode all over the place on that thing. We had a hilly neighborhood and I rode up and down the hills of the streets and, and off-road too. And my friends and I were pretty much every afternoon after school and most of the summer you'd find us on our bikes. And then one day I got the idea that I would try an off-road stunt. I decided to ride down a steep slope. There, there was a vacant lot down below our house and uh, there was nothing on it. About 200 feet it was level and then it dropped straight down to the alley below. It looked like it was about a mile straight down from up above, but it was really probably 30 or 40 yards. It was steep though, and it was covered with grass. It was winter time, so the grass was dead, but I thought I would just ride down that thing and then ride back up the alley to our house. 
And what I didn't realize, there was an, an indentation, uh, almost a hole, about three quarters of the way down. It was covered with grass so you couldn't see it. So I started over the edge doing just fine until I hit that, that hole. My front wheel went in, the back flipped over me, I hit the ground and it landed in the alley far below. Not, that's not me, I never wore a helmet. But I was fine. The bike was pretty bent up though. And instead of riding it up, I pushed it back up the hill. Later my dad helped me straighten those handlebars out and everything else on the bike. And I told him, I said, Dad, when I hit that hole, that was the point of no return. And he said, no, when you started over the top, that was the point of no return. The point of no return is the title of our discussion today, and for good reason. You know, way back in September of last year, we kicked off what we call Celebration Sunday, and we revealed this year's theme and focus here at Westwood for the, for the school year. Who do you say I am? Reflecting Jesus' question, to anyone who would follow him, it's a good question to ask any time, but particularly on Palm Sunday. One more slide, Michael. There it is. You may remember the story when Jesus asked this question to his disciples. Who do people say I am? Is the way he started it off. A little like the you know, marketing type thing, what others are saying. What are others saying about me? And the disciples answered. Some say John the Baptist who had been killed in uh, Herod's prison by that point. Others say Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. One of those prophets that during their lifetime, people thought might be the Messiah, the one to save the people of Israel. But then Jesus turned the question straight to his disciples, but who do you say I am? And that's when Simon answered, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. You know, Christ is a Greek translation of the Hebrew Messiah, the one who redeems, the one who saves. The ancient prophets, as, we, as Carl read this morning, had foretold of a great Savior for the people of Israel. And they had been looking and watching and waiting for this anointed one over the years, the one who would come, the one who would make the nation great again, as in the days of David, King David, as in the days of David's son, King Solomon. When Simon said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus answered and said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Nobody gave you this information. Nobody told you this. You heard it straight from my father in heaven. Jesus goes on, and now I'm giving you a new name. You will be Petros, Peter, the rock. And on this rock, I will build my church, he said, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Peter got it. He understood what God told him, but if you were to ask him or any of the others what Christ, what Messiah, Son of living God actually meant, their answer would be more like conquering king or liberator from the Romans as opposed to prince of peace. They thought of the Messiah as a military general, a king like King David, who would defeat all of Israel's enemies in battle, in which, as we know, was not the case of the Messiah as God had planned. Still, it was a cause for celebration, as Jesus noted. His followers were beginning to catch on. They were beginning to understand who Jesus was. Things were looking up. A week later, in all of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus took Peter and James and John up onto a mountain, and there he was transformed. His face, his clothes became bright like lightning. And Moses, Elijah, appeared as well, as if to differentiate from those other people whom they were saying that Jesus was. And then there was that voice from heaven, this is my son, listen to him. Many Bible scholars agree that, that these scenes mark the high point of Jesus' career, his ministry, his time with the disciples. As everyone knows, when you reach the zenith, the high point of anything, the only way from there is down. You know, we've all heard stories of stars whose careers peaked at a certain point only to decline after that. And in a way, that's how Jesus' ministry went from the time Simon Peter answered up through that fateful Passover. 
that first Holy Week, Jesus' popularity didn't wane. It, it, it grew with the people. But after that conversation, things went down for Jesus in three ways. First, geographically, he was literally headed with the disciples down from the area of the Galilee, down toward Jerusalem, going down toward that city on the hill. And the second way things were going down for Jesus was with those who opposed him. The people loved him. And they followed him. But from the first, he had made enemies. Enemies of, among the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, those who, who saw Jesus as a threat to their power. Those who had such a narrow view of God's word, that, that of the ancient prophecies about the Messiah, that they refused to consider anything other than their own definition. They refused to consider that he might be the one. Again and again, we read in the gospel accounts, so they looked for ways to trip him up. So they, they plotted against him. So they looked for ways they could trap him. And then there was a third way, perhaps the most important way, the most crucial of all, right after Peter's answer, you're the Christ, Jesus began to tell them how he would have to suffer and die. But they'd have none of it. After all, they just agreed he was the Messiah. This didn't fit the narrative. Simon Peter said, God forbid it. This shall never happen to you. And that's when Jesus delivered that famous line, get behind me, Satan. For you don't have God's interests, but man's on your heart. The gospel accounts then give many pointed, repeated examples of how Jesus' disciples did not get it after that. He tried to explain the suffering he had to go through, his impending death. Almost as importantly, they also missed it when Jesus repeatedly tried to explain that more than follower, disciples are those who imitate, those who emulate their leader. They would have to suffer and possibly die as well. How frustrating it must have been for Jesus when the disciples just did not get it. And by the time that Jesus' journey, his ministry, his life reached today's scripture reading, he and the disciples have almost reached Jerusalem for Passover, that high point of the Jewish celebrations in the Jewish year. It was even bigger than Christmas is for us, if you can believe that. The week-long feast remembering God's deliverance of the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt. Did anybody see uh, the Ten Commandments? It was on TV again last night, and it depicts that as only Hollywood in the Golden Age could. But this big celebration was where they were headed, remembering the deliverance from the slavery in Egypt and the last plague that the Lord had used to afflict the Egyptians so that they would let the children of Israel go was when every firstborn in the land was killed by the angel of death. The Lord told Moses to tell the people to kill a lamb, smear the blood on their doorposts so the angel of death would pass over their homes, spare the firstborn of the Jewish families, they were to cook this lamb and eat it with unleavened bread put together quickly. They were to eat it standing up with their, their travel clothes on because they were about to be delivered. They were about to travel. It's interesting that the lamb's blood is symbolic of the price paid for their freedom. It became prophetic about the blood of the lamb of God, which before the week was out at that last Passover would be shed for all people. Jesus' enemies were expecting him. They knew that he and the disciples had made the Jerusalem trip before. They figured they would do it again this time, and they were watching. They were watching for an opportunity to accuse him of breaking the Jewish laws. It would be blasphemy to claim to be the Messiah, punishable by death. But Jesus threw them all a curveball. He and the disciples got close to Jerusalem, to the town of Bethany, where Mary and Martha and Lazarus led, lived. He had, they had planned to stay with them during Passover, make it a kind of a, a home base for them, going down into the city each day of the celebration, returning back to their home each evening. Before they got to Bethany, 
As we read, Jesus sent two disciples ahead into the village. They find a colt tied. Two of the gospels say it was a donkey. They were to tell the owners if they were asked, the Lord has need of it. And they found the animal just as Jesus said. They brought it to him right as he and the others had arrived into town. The disciples laid coats on the colt and they put Jesus on it. And as with the other gospel stories, there, there are a few details that, that don't quite mesh up. Some of the details vary. Only Luke has them spread their coats on the ground or on the road. The other three say that they spread branches. John alone says palms. Others too. Other details that, that don't line up. Mark and Luke call it a colt. Matthew and John say it was a donkey. The point is, what seemed like an impromptu processional ensued, like, like a ticker tape parade for a hero, like a World Series winner or a Super Bowl champion team. Jesus started down the hill to Jerusalem. It's about as far as from Westwood down to Mays Road over here, a little over a mile and a half. And you can picture the scene, the donkey, the branches, the coats on the donkey, on the road, Jesus riding slowly down into Jerusalem. And the people began to call out, save us, Hosanna. And blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, straight out of the Psalms. If those temple leaders, Jesus' enemies, were hoping to apprehend him at this point, as he drew near the city, they were surely caught off guard. These adoring crowds were lining the roads. There was nothing the Pharisees or any of the others could do at this point. It would have incited a riot. Luke writes that they told Jesus to silence the crowds, but he replied, if these become silent, the very stones will cry out. Because although this little parade seemed spontaneous, it seemed impromptu, it wasn't. God had planned this event, something normally reserved for a conquering king, to declare just that. Jesus Christ was about to become a conquering king, but not as the world, not as you and I would envision. He would indeed become a sac the sacrificial lamb of God. He would become the prince of peace conquering sin and death in the process. But imagine, if you will, how Jesus must have felt during all this, from the instructions he gave to go secure the donkey, the colt. We know that, that he had planned that He was in on this too. But to put it in the context of what's been going on, he had been telling his followers he'd surely be killed, he'd have to suffer, and all along, they, they could not, they would not understand. At this point, they still don't get it as they come into Bethany, as they approach Jerusalem during Jesus' triumphal entry into the city. The crowds were cheering their conquering hero, but they had no idea. They did not know that his death was only a few days away. Can you imagine how alone Jesus must have felt because he knew. In the midst of these cheering, unaware crowds as he rode, it must have been surreal for him. You know, Jesus could have refused all this. He could have walked away, but he didn't. Of course, he saw it through to the end. All for love, love for this world, love for us. In the eyes of the world, the temple leaders, the Pharisees, the others, Jesus was just another outspoken, small-time leader tapping into the discontent of the times, operating outside their control. But as is often the case, God had other plans, plans that they could not see. And when Jesus remained faithful to his heavenly Father, faithful to us, God raised him from the dead. And nothing has been the same since. You know, I still like to ride my bicycle. I don't get to nearly as much anymore. But I also like to drive nowadays. Love to drive out in the country. Love to see the farmland. Drive through towns. You never know what you're gonna, you might see out there. Like the, the beautiful sunflower sign as you're coming into uh, Mineola, Kansas. Or the sign advertising the world's largest hand dug well in Greensburg. 
But if you go through the town of Clarendon, going down 287, which goes all the way across the country, but as it cuts through the Texas panhandle, you'll go through a town that is filled with crosses made out of PVC, Jesus signs all along the road, even before you come into town. There are some about heaven and some about hell and everything in between. But there's one sign in particular that stood out for me. The first time I drove through Clarendon, since they put all those signs out, there's a sign that says, Jesus did not tap out. He loves you. I had no idea what that sign meant. I tried to figure it out, thought about it. But at the time, our son was on the high school wrestling team, and it dawned on me. See, to tap out, which you may know, is to, to hit the mat, saying, I've had enough, I'm done, I'm out, I quit. But Jesus didn't do that. He loves you. And look what God did in response. I'd invite you to read those stories again this Holy Week from the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There are different details, but it's the same story. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on his last Passover here on earth. I'd invite you to picture the story like a, a movie in your mind. You can see, can you see the crowds? Hear the hosannas. But as you watch, pay attention to the lonely man riding there on the donkey. Watch him as he slowly rides by, looking all alone in the middle of that crowd. Know that when he started down that hill from Bethany to Jerusalem, he indeed passed the point of no return. When things would quickly begin to transpire on his way to the cross. Although he could have, he didn't walk away. He didn't tap out. He chose you because he loves you. Watch him now as he passes by. And as he draws even, he turns and looks into your eyes and says to you now, who do you say I am? Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for what he has done for us. We pray that this, this time, that this holy week, that you would make it even more real for us. Help us to take to our very hearts what he has done so that we might understand a little more. And then as we as we celebrate not only his death, but his resurrection. Make us faithful disciples who will share that good news with everything that we say and do. We pray this in his name. Amen. Our sending him is what wondrous love is this. Let's stand and sing.
now from this place. If you've received a blessing here today, pass it on. Let God make you a blessing wherever he may send you. And as you go through Holy Week, now more than ever, think about Jesus, read about Jesus, talk to Jesus, and thank him for what he's done for you. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be ours both now and evermore. Amen.